Hola, ¿qué tal? Buenas tardes. Uh, estamos en la segunda plática plenaria del Congreso Interno del Cefata. En, en esta ocasión tenemos al doctor John uh, Poiman de la Universidad Estatal de Luisiana. Eh, ahora voy a cambiar uh, a inglés para poder Hola, presentar. Tal? Buenas tardes. Uh, estamos en la segunda plática. So, uh, welcome. Welcome, John, to our um, internal conference or for institution. Uh, thank you very much for accepting this invitation. So my I'll, pleasure. Excellent. So I'll I'll read um, an introduction for you. So um, Dr. John Poyman, a native of North Royalton, Ohio, received his bachelor of um, science in chemistry with a minor in classics from Georgetown University in eighty. In 1984, he earned his doctorate in chemi chemical physics in 1988 at the University of Texas at Austin. Poyman then worked with uh, two years at Brandeis University with Irwin Epstein. In 1990, he joined the chemistry and biochemistry department at the University of Southern Mississippi, where he taught for 18 years. Dr. Poyman joined the Department of Chemistry at Louisiana State University in August 20. Um, Eight, where he's a professor of macromolecular science and director of graduate studies. Poyman has co-authored one monograph, an introduction to nonlinear chemical dynamics, and co-edited two others. He has, has served four times as a guest editor for the journal Chaos. He has authored 165 peer-reviewed publications and 10 book chapters. Professor Poyman has made 294 presentations and received two patents. Professor Poyman is an expert on nonlinear dynamics in polymer systems and effective interfacial tension between miscible fluids. He is an, an avid bass fisherman and amateur herpetologist with a special <laughs> interest in the aquatic salamanders of Louisiana. Um, he's also boasts the world's largest collection of pocket protectors. Maybe you can tell everybody what is a pocket protector later on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, and John is the president and CEO of Poyman Polymer Products, LLC. So he lives in Baton Rouge with his wife, Dion Rousseau, and a 19 years old son, old son John Jr. So um, thank you again for accepting this invitation, John, and the audience is all yours. Well, thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here, to be able to visit virtually. I have visited Catetero, and it's always a great time to talk with uh, uh, Josue, uh, Dr. Moto Morales, who's a, a brilliant scientist, as you know, and I was very lucky that he spent a year in Baton Rouge, and I know I learned more from him than I'm sure he learned from me. But we had a great time, and I'm uh, hoping to get back down again and visit. Mm -hmm. Let's see, we're not that one. Okay. So today I want to do accomplish a couple of things. First, I want to tell you about our own research on cure on demand polymerization and how we've applied it to adhesives, wood repair, and art. But I also want to tell you about graduate school in the United States and specifically at LSU, because why we're very enthusiastic to be able to talk to people about opportunities uh, at LSU. So LSU is a program that is, it is truly committed to diversity, excellence, and inclusion. And we're very proud of the fact that uh, half of our uh, PhD graduates at the undergraduate and graduate level are women. We graduate the most number of uh, African-American PhDs in the nation. And we have a growing Hispanic population among our student body and one that we'd like to increase. So our faculty, uh, this is you know the usual suspects, lots of great people. Uh, our junior faculty have been enormously successful. And we now have uh, three new faculty, Dr. Uh, Amy Shu, Dr. Uh, Fatima Rivas, and Victor Garcia Lopez. And um, to, uh, Victor is in fact, um, he is from Monterey. So we're very excited to have these new colleagues who are able to join us in the middle of this pandemic. We have students from all these different parts of the country. And you can see Louisiana is right down here, just right across the, the Gulf.
from um, uh, the Yucatan Peninsula. Really not that far. I love visiting Queretaro because you just fly over to Dallas, about an hour, a couple hour flight down here, the world's fastest passport and customs. I love the Queretaro airport. So it's really great to visit. We're really not that far away. We also have students from 19 different countries. And I think that really is unusual for an American graduate program. Half of our students are domestic and the other half are from 19 different countries. And you know, we have large groups of students from Bangladesh, uh, Nigeria, Kenya, Sri Lanka. We really hope to have students from Mexico. And this is just the information about how our degrees are distributed. 20, uh, URM means underrepresented minorities. So the success of women underrepresented minorities in our program is just indicative that we're a program that is committed to all students succeeding. The, we have room for everybody. When someone is ex accepted, we have no reason to ha uh, have students leave the program early. We want every single student to succeed. Our students go on to work in the industry, working in government labs. Some become professors, we scientific consulting. We just had a talk by a student who got his PhD and now he got his, he's now a patent attorney. He went to law school. And we work in the whole range of, uh, of chemical problems and with a growing area emphasis now on chemical biology. We have outstanding facilities. We just have a brand new 700, uh, NMR, um, 700 megahertz NMR to add to our other facilities, great x-ray and uh, mass spec facilities. Baton Rouge is really a, a interesting town because it's the state capital. It's we're uh, 100 kilometers from New Orleans, up river, up the Mississippi River, and between Baton Rouge and New Orleans, about 40 percent of the petrochemicals of America are produced. So it is a a dynamic area, but it's a it's a nice city of about 400,000 people. The campus is really beautiful because it has the beautiful live oak trees. This these are the azaleas in the springtime, which I really like. I'm originally from, as they say, Ohio, a thousand miles north. And this time of year, it's starting to get cold and gray. Now here, it's still really beautiful. We have a really great group of students who work together. There's a group for macromolecular students, all the graduate students, the National Organization of Black Chemistry and Chemical Engineers who work together to put on activities. And this is self-generated. This is not something the faculty have anything to do with. So those. 140 graduate students work together and help each other. Just a reminder, what does it cost to go to graduate school? This is true in any American chemistry graduate program, nothing. You'll be paid either as a research assistant or a teaching assistant, your tuition will be waived. So it will actually cost you nothing. Students are usually paid um, between 25 and say 30,000 a year. It takes nationally about five to seven, 5.7 years. Our program is about five years. It's not a coursework degree. We have no minimum coursework. Students will take on average about five classes their first year and they may never take a class again. It's, it is a research lab degree. You do not need a master's degree before getting a PhD. You just simply enter the doctoral program and you get to choose your own advisor. So it's a really, uh, it was certainly one of my favorite times in my life to be able to have that kind of intellectual freedom. With now 32 faculty members, you have a lot of choices. We have traditional areas of chemistry, but we have a lot of focus areas in like soft materials. We have a lot of emphasis on macromolecular chemistry and now chemical biology. So this is kind of the, the first year taking some classes, choosing an advisory committee, taking a general exam. After that, it's pretty much all just working on research. If you have more interest in this, uh, here's our website. You can, or just email gradchem at LSU. Go to our website, chemistry.lsu.edu, or email me. Now I'm uh, I'm the chair of the department, so I certainly can be uh, um, helpful, or I'll direct you to the people who are experts on this. So I'm John at Poyman.com. So I want to tell you a little bit now about Louisiana, why I love it so much, and then also talk about the research I do. For example. The, uh, if you know the show Jeopardy, I don't know if uh, Josue, if, that, if anyone in Mexico knows what Jeopardy is, it was a game show, the, uh, Alex Trebek just died, uh, where they give you the answer and you have to guess the question. So the answer is the three-toed amphiuma. 
And the question is, what's the cutest animal in the world? And this is a very large salamander. These get uh, big, um, up to about a meter in length. They're incredibly common in Baton Rouge. I had one that was, I claimed the world's largest, Dion. She weighed about 10 pounds, almost five kilograms. And what makes them particularly interesting is they live everywhere in Baton Rouge and throughout the South, but very little is known about their life. And also very interestingly, biochemically, they have a, their skin prevents infection. We don't know how. They're also immune to a, what's called the chytrid fungus, which is wiping out um, amphibians around the world. So they have a natural immunity. And so one area of research I do is quasi hobby is we collect the slime and we're doing um, proteomics, trying to identify the components. Mostly I just like catching them. Oh, the answer is 860,000. The question, how many squirrels are eaten in Louisiana? People in Louisiana are really big at hunting and fishing. And one thing that's very popular is squirrel hunting. Now I love visiting Mexico. Uh, of course, mostly the people, wonderful people, excellent food, but I also like the, some of the other inhabitants. When I was down at in Huatuco, I would like to, I bring a, a lasso and catch iguanas, not to eat them, just to, to look at them. I just am fascinated by them. So that's really a, a tremendous diversity and beauty in Mexico. This is kind of my general theme has been to look at doing something called nonlinear dynamics and attach, connect it to polymer chemistry. So nonlinear dynamics is a study of oscillation, waves, patterns, and chaos. And my goal, that was work I did with uh, Irving Epstein, who's really the world expert in the topic, and then applying it now to polymer chemistry, and particularly how to do something useful with it. So here's a take home message. If you need to leave, remember this. I'm gonna tell you about clock reactions and how they can be used to create a time-lapse polymerization. And I'm gonna tell you about something called frontal polymerization that can create cure on demand polymerization for adhesives, wood fillers, and art. So a time-lapse polymerization, this means you mix things together and it won't react until some period of time when you have an abrupt change. And this can be done with, it's called a clock reaction. So you may have seen clock reactions in the general chemistry lab, you mix them together and then you'll have an abrupt color change or a pH change. Those systems are usually inorganic or involve materials like formaldehyde. So they're not easy to imagine being used as a, say, a, a consumer products. So we've been working, um, originally got this idea back in 1995 of using a enzyme called urease, which converts urea, which is the major a component in urine, it, can, it catalyzes the conversion to ammonia. And most, if not all, enzymes have a pH dependence in their activity. So they're most active, say this is most active around pH seven. So if you look at this reaction, you can see if you start at low pH, it's gonna slowly hydrolyze and give ammonia. That will move the pH up. And as it does that, the reaction goes faster, it produces more ammonia, and you get this increase in the rate. And this is what you observe, this very abrupt change which is like a clock. You can program it, say, depending on how much enzyme you add or what your initial pH is. Well, then we realized if we take this pH change, can we use it to trigger or cause another process to happen? The answer is yes. We use a thiol acrylate polymerization. So a thiol is a weak acid. And if we can deprotonate it, it can undergo a Michael addition with an acrylate. And so these are the kind of experiments you can do. This is just showing the pH as a function of time. And this is now the initial solution. And then after it, the pH goes up, it's now a gel. And you can see it's a clear gel. It's also possible to get a propagating front. So this is a movie is sped up. But what's happening, it's a split view. On the left is a pH indicator system. So we started out a system at low pH add a little bit of base, the reaction causes the production of ammonia, which diffuses, causes fast reaction, and you get a reaction that propagates with a constant velocity. This is showing that simultaneously, we're having a conversion of monomer monomers into polymer. So this is an um, exciting process. Um, to be commercially useful, we have to find a way that, to make it so that we can store it this way. We wanna have a very long shelf life. This system, once you mix it up, after a few hours, it's gonna react anyway. So having a front is not such a clear advantage. 
But it's also possible to, by changing the final pH, you can get hydrogel degradation. So you get a system that turns into a gel and then over hours it will degrade. Now, what's made this particularly interesting is instead of having to buy commercial urea, uh, urease, uh, we found watermelon seeds are extremely, uh, have extremely large amount of uh, urease in their seeds. So you can grind them up in a coffee grinder and use them as a source of the urease. So this was a, a student who was studying making a, a glue or adhesive for wood. So initially this is low pH, and then after a certain period of time, the pH would go up and now the wood is glued together. So before that time, you can move it around, you can adjust it, and then it's gonna react quickly. So we're now working on that to be able to, uh, actually working with a company in Atlanta to develop a commercial product on this and eventually trying to make a system that is uh, so benign, it would be edible. All the components would be safe and trying to get away from using materials that might be more irritating like isocyanate. So we're working currently, a, a, a brilliant student, Anthony Mai, and with my uh, good friend and collaborator, uh, Professor Taylor at the University of Sheffield. And Anthony found by taking his watermelon seed powder, washing with acetone, he could get a pretty much mono disperse system of particles. And we don't really understand what these exactly what these particles are. They seem to be some kind of protein body and it inside there it's rich in urease and possibly other enzymes. But using those, Anthony put those inside of an agar particles a naturally occurring gel with iron oxide, and he can move them around then with a magnet. And with Dr. Taylor, we studied what's called quorum sensing, which means you need to have a critical number of particles before you have a the uh, clock reaction. And so this is just showing that if you have, say, just one particle, it uh, at this concentration will never undergo this abrupt increase in pH. But it, on a certain situation here, if you go from two to three, you can get the behavior. So there's a they act together in a cooperative behavior, which is similar to how bacteria form biofilms. So we're right now trying to create analogs to biofilms and devices and microfluidics. And so what Anthony was doing is making little uh, particles that actually, as it reacts, it keeps producing the ammonia and causing the reaction. So these are some time-lapse movies he did is showing he puts these in here and the clear zone indicates there's polymerization. And Dr. Taylor then was able to do the numerical simulation and show this is a diffusive process of ammonia production. Anthony has been able to put them into a, a flow so he can localize a polymerization where he puts the particles, he can move those particles around initially using a magnet and then after they're done, I don't know if you know what the term tiddlywinks, uh, a kid's game with little discs that you can play with. These look reminiscent of that, these discs. And then by putting different solutions through, you could make different colored layers or different um, structures. So one problem is stability. If you're using an enzyme, unless it's gonna be stable for a long time, it's hard to see how you can use that industrially. If you have to refrigerate a product, it's not gonna be useful as a construction product. So one way we've been working with um, Dr. G in Beijing, who was attaching it, the, uh, the um, urease to particles to see if that would stabilize it. And indeed it, it did enhance the stability. So this is the immobilized enzyme versus the free enzyme, but you can see it did increase it, but still we've lost almost 50% of our activity uh, at the, uh, You have a 60, about 70, 25, yeah, what, yeah, 30 percent of our activity after two weeks. So that's still not good enough. So it's an improvement, but it's not good enough. It did shift this pH dependence of the activity, which is interesting, but not what we wanted to accomplish. We really want to control this polymerization. So that's where we stand. This is a great system to study, and we're making lots of progress with it. But let me switch to another process called uh, this frontal polymerization. So it's a coupling of the heat release of a polymerization with the erroneous dependence of the reaction rate. Very simple experiments to perform. So you can think about it, it's very similar to a burning cigarette, a burning cigar. 
You have a reaction that produces heat. The heat spreads. That causes more chemical reaction, which releases more heat. And you have a self-propagating process. So this is an example here of um, a mixture of acrylates. So these are co commercial products mixed with a clay to make it like a putty that can be molded. And there was a dye that changed color when it reacted. So you can see the reaction. And these are centimeter marks. So this is just propagating. We started it. Once you start it, it'll go no matter how long the sample is. And here it's now starting another reaction. So that's a very easy, these experiments are extremely easy to perform with some systems. They're characterized by having a large temperature gradient. It can get up to, uh, you know, over 200 degrees centigrade. Some of the reactions can propagate very rapidly. I love this movie because it reminds me of an old TV Western movie where they light the gunpowder and they have to escape. So we're working now to control these systems to make them less violent, but more useful. But these are propagating about as fast as gunpowder burns, about a tenth of a kilometer per hour. One thing that appealed to me initially was the fact that when these reactions propagate, they don't always propagate just as a flat reaction front. They can propagate as a helix. These are called spin modes. And this is well known for thermite reactions. Um, sometimes some kind of rocket motor burning. It was well studied back in the 70s and 80s in Russia. And this is a nice experiment where we take a, uh, a acrylate system and we put a glow in the dark powder, a phosphorescent powder on the surface and it glows brightest when it gets hot. And so this is sped up, but you can see this reaction is going around and around in this helical pattern. And these are just really, there's no easy way to explain this in terms of chemistry. It has nothing to do with chirality. It only, you can have all of this if you just simply have a, a produces B and gives off heat with an exponential dependence on temperature. And all these kind of behaviors can be seen. But one thing we're doing now is how do we make these reactions go faster without changing the chemistry? And one way is to put in uh, um, materials that conduct heat very well. And this has got extremely interesting. And these are fun experiments. These were done by uh, uh, a senior chemistry student. And you can see that where the copper is, the heat is conducted. And so it accelerates the front propagation. And all of these wave patterns, those are these complicated spin modes happen. And here we found that just by putting on a, uh, putting a copper wire in it, we can make the front suns double its speed. And uh, Current studies have shown you don't even need a wire. You can just use a very thin sheet of aluminum foil and you can make the, the reaction double in speed. So that's an advantage because you want to reduce some of the expensive components of the system, but still get a rapid reaction. And we've been working with the, um, University of Illinois and they've been able to simulate yeah, I don't know why that movie is not showing anything. Well, they've been able to sh simulate this sort of behavior. Now, let me tell you about what we call cure on demand. It's not a medical term. We don't mean cure as in cure a disease. We mean to cause a chemical reaction. And we want it to happen when we want it to happen. So we'd like to have a system that you don't have, you mix it up and it'll sit on the shelf for months, years. And when you want it to, you can get the process completed very rapidly. So let's look at some of the commercial products as this now. We'd working on cure on demand putty and adhesives. So adhesives, it's a huge industry. Look at $20 billion a year. Uh, that was 10 years ago. And a product, I don't know if it's sold in uh, Mexico. It's a very popular product here called Gorilla Glue. It's just an isocyanate system. They have no patent on this chemistry, but they have a very clever marketing campaign. So I thought maybe I could make Gorilla Glue on a revolutionary adhesive. I should have a laugh track because I think this is a good joke. But the idea is to use, uh, again, create some kind of adhesive that would have revolutionary behavior. So this is my son demonstrating what we call tiger glue. And basically he's just putting it between, he's putting it between wood using a soldering iron, which is, gets up to a couple hundred degrees centigrade. And he heats it. The wood will sit there for months, years and never react. Once he heats one little part of it, 
it reacts in seconds. So it does work. We were able to actually make a, a cure on demand wood adhesive. Uh, the problem is it, it doesn't work unless the, the layer is uh, has a minimum thickness of about 0.3 millimeters. So that kind of limits its application. It also has trouble working on systems that absorb heat well. So for example, different types of wood have different thermal conductivity. And so that led us saying we need to get better chemistry, more reactive chemistry. That's what we're studying now. So how do we get frontally cured adhesives on high conducting surfaces or in very thin layers? So one big area that I'm really challenged by is the coatings industry. I mean, probably now it's over $100 billion a year. Uh, photo cured coatings are great. You shine a, a UV light and you can cause a rapid reaction. The problem is if you have any kind of non-uniform surface or you have anywhere the light casts a shadow, you don't get cured. So here's an early experiment. I did myself uh, 10 years ago. And we can see that we get this self-propagating reaction. So we started working with uh, uh, the North Dakota State University, which is a long history working in coatings, to develop true coatings, not these kind of, you know, couple millimeter thick layers, but real coatings, carefully control them, and then be able to analyze them, their properties. So this was done imaging with an infrared camera and found that, you know, we're getting here that our now, uh, this coating is in something called mills, all right? Well, if you had something that was say three tenths, 0.4 millimeters, pretty thin, we could get front seconds to propagate pretty fast and get pretty high front temperatures. And this is examples here where you could get, this is what the cured layer looks like. This is on pine wood. One problem is the coatings are rather porous. So doing um, micro CT, uh, microtomography on it, we can see that it's about 30% porous. And that's caused by byproducts of the polymerization reaction, the initiator decomposition. So one area we'd like to do is try to reduce that if you want to have a more solid material. Another area is I think it's called wood putties. And actually, let me um, stop sharing for a second and then reshare. Let's see, am I gonna be able to do that? And you'll see why here, okay. Okay, very good. So this is one problem with some of these, when you have a little hole that we wanna repair the wood. Some systems, when they harden, they shrink. So you're not left with a uniform surface. Another way people use are epoxies. Some of these take, uh, you have to mix them. You have about 15 minutes to work and they still take about 24 hours to get full strength. So I started a company called Poyman Polymer Products, 3P LLC. So I'm the 3P CEO. Just for reference, that's an excellent joke in America. And these are the products I'm selling. So this is called Quick Cure Wood Filler. So we've got a, a, de a, de a defect in the wood. This material will sit on the shelf for uh, years, open, buy it. Heat it with a heat gun to about 100 degrees centigrade. And you can watch the reaction. Now it's done. You can sand it and paint it, stain it. So you can do this repair really in under a minute. So that, if you go to, uh, that's current materials. I'm uh, uh, finalizing products and then uh, I'm selling them myself online and hopefully eventually get a license into a larger company. But one area which has surprised me a lot is I never anticipated actually getting involved with art. I'm not an artist, but I was approached by some people and said, look, I think this might be good for art materials. So ultimately, we started doing working on creating a sculpting material called Quick Cure Clay. It has a shelf life of years, no mixing required. And so this, for example, you can sculpt this here and I just heated it up with a lighter and the reaction is now propagating. You see a little bit of some vapors coming off. But then this is after a couple of minutes, it's done. 
it's hard as a rock. So this allows people to do different types of art than they could do before. I developed this with an artist named Shelby Printable when she was at LSU and she did her uh, graduate art project, her master's of fine art using this quick cure clay. And again, this there's no wires or anything in here so she could build up these sculptures, things that which she would not be able to do with traditional ceramics. When she was a professor at the University of St. Mary, I visited on my sabbatical. We got to see, let the students try out and test things. So these are some of the art that they prepared. You could do very large sculptures by forming it over uh, paper. So it's, it's, it's hollow. Or you could do very delicate materials. Uh, LSU art department offered a class a couple of years ago and I got to go with them every day and let them test out products and help me, help me finalize it. Some really nice, uh, beautiful art that they could create. Again, something like this would be extremely difficult to do with traditional ceramics because all this fine structure will collapse. So this artist, he built it up piecewise. He could cure it, add another piece, heat it, and keep building up this really complicated structure. I like to wear brooches. And so I remember being with Josue in a ACS meeting in um, San Diego, and somebody came up to me in the street and said, hey, nice brooch, man. It's a very odd compliment to receive. But these were brooches I made by taking fossils, making a silicone mold, sticking the quick cure clay and curing it, and now you had a replica. Again, this is what some artists do who are actually very competent at making very delicate structures. Um, this probably is too subtle, but this is an appearance cameo as opposed to a cameo appearance in a movie. But look at there, these I made some faux turquoise cufflinks. This took me about a minute. Put the clay in there, cure it, put some pigment on it, boom, it was done. But real artists like Shelby Printable make these incredibly detailed structures. I mean, this really looks like moss growing on the wall or this slug climbing on wood. So she could, the nice thing is she can travel to another country. I think she was in Spain that summer, took up five pounds of quicker clay, a heat gun and acrylic paints. And she could do all this there. She didn't need a kiln. She didn't need an oven to bake anything. Or this very, very detailed leaf. One of my favorites here, I, uh, I own this one. It's called The Slightest Disturbance, this beautiful frog. Those eyes are really, really well done. Or these mushrooms, or this bas relief of a sloth. So she just can push this right onto the wood and it adheres. And she did these, this installation at a garden in uh, France and she could do it right in place. She didn't need to, she could cure it right in place and paint it. Um, this is uh, snails all piled on top of each other. One of my favorites here is this uh, rabbit that looks very much like Albert Durer's famous hair. Again, look at the detail of the toes, really very finely detailed. We have been experimenting with trying to do 3D printing with it. We worked with a company called Hyrel 3D. They showed you could do it. You could extrude it and print it. I'm just not sure if there's a market for that, but it can be done. And finally, I was able then to license this to a company in New Jersey called um, Ranger Industries, and they are now selling quick cure clay around the world. And that's been enormously fun to, to be able to see what artists could do with it. And this example is a lot of people originally using it for jewelry making. Um, this was at a trade show where a woman was demonstrating it. Got on the cover of Art Materials Retailer. I was kind of excited to see them featuring this product. And again, these kind of really whimsical sculptures. People like to do mixed media. You can stick the legs, the wood right into it. It doesn't get hot enough to burn it. So you could actually build your structure, your sculpture with from different components, paper, wood, metal or do it right onto things like a gourd. And then um, this uh, um, Sharon Harris woman started a, a quick cure clay group on Facebook. And so that's been a wonderful way to meet people from around the world. I found uh, a late, a woman was doing sculpture and she was in Bangalore, India. So I offered to buy some of her sculpture. She said, why are you buying sculpture? Why don't you make your own? I said, I'm a chemistry professor. I don't know how to do sculpture. So it was fun to see a material invented in Baton Rouge, manufactured in New Jersey, crafted in Bangalore, India, then shipped back to Baton Rouge. These are some other really beautiful, fine sculptures people can make. I really like this uh, jackrabbit. And again, people using this really beautiful textures with different things called alcohol inks. Buttons, I didn't see why this. One thing that's fun is I actually make my own buttons and then developed a resin 
that will cure on it that can be put through a dry cleaner. So you can make buttons that custom buttons that will not be damaged by a washer, dryer, or a dry cleaner. An artist in uh, Missouri makes these really again, beautiful, delicate flowers. And this is something I just bought today from an artist in Michigan. He, uh, he makes a lot of these really nice uh, planters. So this is a hanging planter made from Quaker clay. Again, more jewelry. Uh, again, it's Tim Marsh. I think I'm single-handedly supporting his, uh, his career by buying his art, but I really like this squid or, or cuttlefish. A nice feature as a chemist, you say, well, how temperature stable is it? You may have heard things called polymer clays, which are based on polyvinyl chloride, PVC. They're plastisols. You have to heat them in an oven to harden them, but they're not very they're not great at high temperature. So this was, I was trying to make a, an incense burner for my son. And this actually destroyed the clay and produced hydrogen chloride gas. This could be stable up to 350 degrees centigrade. A, a really great project was I have an actual unicorn skull that was actually made by an artist in Mississippi. It actually was a, a deer skull with, and he put the, the horn on it, or he made a triceratops for me. Um, an artist in South Dakota makes, she's a commercial artist. She makes lots and lots of these, she calls adornments and she manufactures on a big scale. So the fact that she can do this really fast is important to her. And also you can actually roll this out and make it paper thin. So get very delicate sculptures. I had great fun. Uh, last year I visited Puerto Rico to an artist friend at the store. And as Josue knows, I am nothing if not vain. So people asking me to sign their bags of quick cure clay. That was fun. It was a great group of people and I had never been to uh, Puerto Rico and I was a, uh, it was wonderful to go there. Again, more work students are doing from Shelby Printable, these reliefs done right onto a piece of wood. Or I commissioned a sculpture of a pangolin. I think they're fascinating creatures. And Jose mentioned, what is a pocket protector? This is a pocket protector. If I were visiting you, I would be giving these out if you asked me a question. So this protects your pocket. It's now sort of a joke that people are kind of nerds who wear them. Um, but I have a collection of almost 2,000. One thing artists like about this material is because as the reaction propagates, we saw it could propagate, propagate irregularly. You see the surface is not, it doesn't look like it's injection molded plastic. This is polymer clay and it looks well like it's plastic. It is like, it looks like vinyl. This doesn't. And when you put the some pigments on it, you get these kind of different patterns and you'll never get the same pattern two times in a row. So you really make a unique work of art. You could even make something called, uh, I call it faux raku. Uh, this is true raku. It's a type of uh, glaze process used in ceramics, I think under a reductive atmosphere. This was here by just putting out alcohol inks and then a, a glaze on top of it, a, a clear coat, you could get this. And I've been wearing this, this same one here for years now. New products we've come out with, I was calling it Quick Cure Clay Noir. The company just calls it black. I like Noir better. Uh, working on a Quick Cure Clay Pewter, which is metal-based, has, has metal powder, so it's, it can be polished. I hope the company will license that. Again, this really looks like you made something out of bronze, but in fact, this could be manufactured in a very, very short period of time without having to cast it. And this is just sort of an example of another product. From Poyman Polymer Products, Quick Cure Glaze. It works perfectly with Quick Cure Glaze. Just apply. So this is something like a button. And I had seen people use materials that required hours to dry. And I said, what's the point of a fast curing sculptural material if your coating takes a long time? You can use a 395 nanometer nail this, this is what's used in nail salons to cure uh, coatings for fingernails. That coating is water resistant and all glaze using a handheld. Or you could use these flashlights. Very important to keep it there for the complete 20 seconds. 
to avoid a tacky surface. So Ranger has licenses, and I hope after the pandemic, they'll be able to bring it out into the market. It's also possible to mix in alcohol ink. Again, cure for 20 seconds. Or you get some nice patterns formed probably by surface tension driven convection. We're able to create with Poiman Polymer Products new quick cure glaze. But to demonstrate in a fun effect you can have with quick cure glaze. By hardening this is some things artists showed me because they were playing around with it. And so oh, look, if you cure it while it's dripping, you can make things that look like honey dripping off a beehive. So I'm always impressed with the, uh, a lot of artists are really natural scientists because they're always trying experiments. And that's why I found it really exciting to work with them. As the light hits it, it causes it to harden and cures and you can let it flow and you have some really interesting effects. Well, the, one artist made this for me. This is a combination of quick cure clay. The water is done with the glaze. And, you know, she could make this, teach people to make this in, in an hour or so. Or actually putting this on over a balloon, a latex balloon, curing it and then popping the balloon. So I'm always impressed that people can be so creative. What, what basically is an industrial coating material. And now I'm also working on making a floating version, a quick cure clay light to reduce the density, partly for jewelry. So you, if you want to make earrings or different things, you don't want it to be as heavy, but also to make things that you could put into a pond or a bird bath and it would float. So that's an interesting challenge I'm working on. So take home messages. If you stayed around, clock reactions can make this time-lapse polymerization, but frontal polymerization makes something more interesting. I think a cure on demand polymerization. And I've shown you we could sort of work for adhesives, definitely works for wood fillers, and also now is a new art medium on the market. If you're interested in that, you can uh, check out, um, just go to poiman.com. And lastly, a visual pun, Shelby made for me a ba relief. So see if you can get that one. Uh, I would say only one of my 32 colleagues understands it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, a, it's pretty specialized. Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you, John, for uh, your um, very entertaining presentation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think um, one of the things that, uh, well, if, if, if you don't know, I I made an stay, uh, a postdoc in, in the group of, poem, uh, of John a few years ago, and it was always uh, very exci exciting to, to visit his lab because it was uh, happening every kind of science uh, from a very applied science uh, to a very basic uh, science. So we have a few questions from the public. So uh, in general, so people are um, asking, let me see, uh, Jose Luis uh, it has this question. Have propagating fronts been modeled? Uh, I wonder if either a linear or nonlinear approach is required. They definitely have. There are people who are specialists. And interestingly, this was first discovered in Chernoglovka, Russia in 1972. And the Russians then uh, did an enormous amount of mathematical analysis of it, both just with relatively simple models and including also models where you tried to include a lot of the chemistry. So uh, I am no expert. I, I know very little about it. I know they're very tough problems numerically because you have these enormous spatial gradients and temporal gradients. They're very stiff problems. So there are experts who do it. And if, if someone is interested, if they uh, email me, I can give them references. There's a group at University of Illinois is doing a lot of work on it. And there was a lot of work that came out of Russia um, at Northwestern University. So there's definitely there are people working on that. And they're really helpful to us because they can tell us, you know, try these conditions because we have a lot of experiments we can do. Great yes. question. So, so, so what, what do you think is the, is the uh, limitation in, in modeling this? I mean, you already uh, mentioned the, the, 
the special uh, spatial uh, spatial distribution of the front and uh, all the chemistry involved. But what do you think is the the, the most uh, limiting? Uh, the hard part then is to include the chemistry, because if you start talking about are you like the, the group at Illinois is doing um, ring opening metathesis polymerization, and they have a pretty good model for that, and they get like ninety nine percent conversion. When you start doing acrylate polymerization, it's uh, multifunctional acrylates are extremely different than the model because the rate constants, all the rate constants are a function of conversion. So it becomes really difficult. If you just want to understand the basic phenomena, you don't need to know all the details. And people could use some pretty simple models of A going to B, and they can get the kind of all these kind of generic behavior. It really depends on what level you need to know. Yeah. But also, it's one thing if you want to do one dimensional. When you start doing 2D, when you start getting to 3D, it becomes a real challenge. Yeah. But so there are people also have analytical models too who are experts in developing, who are experts in parabolic differential equations. Yeah. Uh, so we have another question. It, uh, Miguel Ocampo says, uh, could it be possible to make a ceramic or metallic clay able to show front reactions development? Yes. I mean, one is you simply can put metal powders into a current system. And that works. I've done that. There are some new types of polymerization. People are doing uh, geopolymerization um, using inorganic polymerizations. And I think that's a, a neat area where you could make something that would be, say, not simply carbon based. Any kind of system, what you really just need is a system that produces, is exothermic and has a low rate of reaction at room temperature. So we're always looking for new systems because the idea, for example, could you do a rapid repair to your house? the mortar, and that would be permanent. And that's that's kind of, those are great, great ideas. Yeah, so we have another question from uh, Jorge Herrera. So he says, uh, how do you surmount the inhibitory effect of the atmospheric oxygen in frontal free radical polymeriz polymerization? Yeah, well, we got some people actually paying attention out there. I'm impressed. <laughs> <laughs> that's a real question. You know, it's, we don't remove inhibitor and the oxygen, these, the concentrations of initiator we're using are simply um, you know, bizarrely high for the average chemist. I mean, we're using sometimes one, uh, at one time we were using 50% peroxide. In fact, we've gone the other way around where we have 90% peroxide and make a smoke bomb. We were trying to make a smoke grenade. So oxygen is the least of our problems because the, there are so many free radicals produced, they just simply wipe out the effect. It, it's really not a problem. Good question, because it's a real problem in the, in the coatings when you have a, a UV curing, you get that oxygen inhibition and surface tack, but it's not a problem in these systems. So we don't even bother to re, I have never purified a reagent in my life and I don't ever plan on doing it. If I can't use it out of the bottle, I'm going to do something else because I want it to be really easy to use. Yeah, maybe it's, 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 it's worth it to, to mention that on the um, initiator that you use are a liquid, so are very easily to mix with the with the liquid monomers, right? Yes. So, because um, I remember that was that was actually the reason I went to your laboratory because I didn't have access to this mm. uh, huge amounts of or types of, of loop two thirty five. Luprox, yes. I buy it by you know by the uh, uh, literally truckload. They'll they'll say, well, it costs three hundred dollars to buy it, but five hundred dollars to ship it. I said, okay. That's still cheaper than buying a hundred milliliters. Yes, true. Yeah, yeah. Um, John, so there's no more questions here, but I would like you to uh, um, maybe uh, give a message from our students to, so what are your, um, uh, your vision of polymer science? I mean, like uh, you already proved that you've made some fundamental studies. You did some nonlinear uh, dynamics and things, and you are now selling uh, some interesting products. So it will be the, the message from people who are expecting maybe to change the world or to doing something very, very basic. And, and you know, I, nice. I think it could be in, in work you're doing, Jose, because I'm, I'm, I, I think my level of creativity is probably has petered out and I'm just kind of running with ideas I had <laughs> a long time ago. I mean, you kind of work them out, you know, it takes years and then you, but in terms of big problems facing us, you know, making materials that could biodegrade, uh, I'm less... I'm skeptical of biosourcing, that that's really so advantageous, but materials that could be reusable, uh, um, things like recyclable, um, recyclable um, 
thermosets, composites. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical because we have so much land in Louisiana and we're sinking. You know, we could easily put lots of trash in the ground. That's not a real problem for us. But there are issues about how to make you know, a more sustainable approach to doing materials. Because right, everything I'm doing here is based right off of, uh, you know, it's basic petroleum-based chemistry. Because that's what's available right now and it's cheap. But if I could do it with materials, for example, that were uh, non-toxic, uh, less irritation, that's why I like to work when we were doing together with deep detecting solvents. They didn't smell. They didn't have vapor. You know, those are really, really appealing. So that's, uh, I think that's for the next generation. But the future is still plastics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you are, you are in the land of petroleum. So of course you, <laughs> you think that. No, I just said that's what's available. But I, yes. I guess what I would like to see is don't burn petroleum. Use it as a feedstock and then get our energy from other sources. I mean, it's, it's, you know, I, I think it's going to be quite a while before we can switch over to doing things from sustainable materials. And I'm, I just say I'm not convinced it's going to be worth the trouble when oil is cheap. And the more alternative energy source we use, the cheaper oil will become because it'll just be used to make things. It won't be for burning. Um, but if I were starting my career again, um, I would be very interested in engineering and working on issues of sustainability and alternative energy. I think those are, you know, really exciting problems. But maybe, you know, there's, we need re a way to really rethink with green chemistry from the ground up, how to make things that are just all along the way pollute less, cause less contamination, are safer. Um, you know, I say that's, that's for um, a younger, smarter man than I. <laughs> like you, Josue. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, I think we are running out of questions and we will be ready to say hasta pronto. Hasta la vista. Thank you very much, Jen, for this, uh, for your My time. My pleasure. I love right. it. And really, if you have any interest, the possibility of a graduate school, not just at LSU, I just want you to know, no matter what you might think from watching TV, you would be very welcome in Baton Rouge. <laughs> don't, don't, it's the same way when we see Mexico, we may, you only hear bad news about a country and you don't realize that it's all the beauty and wonder there. There's, you hear about some bad things. The same thing in America, that the students um, in Baton Rouge is a very diverse place and um, our international students are extremely welcome. And that would be the case here. And we would just love to have um, students from Mexico join our program. Yes, thank you, Jim. Um, for sure, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell, I can tell you from firsthand that I spent a very wonderful time there It's a very wonderful weather. Uh, the people are kind, and it's just a, a wonderful experience. Uh, and the food is good, huh? Food's good. The food is really good. So there is yeah. a lot of food. If you love seafoods, you will love there. If you if you like outdoors, you will be happy there. Just walking or I don't know, like any kind of outdoor. Or and if if you want to eat squirrels, I I've yet to see a squirrel tamale, but I bet they'd be good. I bet a squirrel tamale would be good. Excellent. So. First, <laughs> For sure, you will you will hear about us about the the, the program the the, the 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 graduate program. So um, and well, for now, that's it, John. So thank you again. Well, I look forward to seeing you in person uh, sometime soon. If the pandemic uh, allow us to go there, maybe that instead of the force be with you. May the pandemic allow. <laughs> may the pandemic allow. <laughs> allow. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Um, and thank you all of you. Gracias a todos por su atención. Y uh, los esperamos mañana a las 10 de la mañana. Tenemos la plática del doctor David Meserreyes. Eh, va a ser una plática acerca de um, polímeros uh, que son conductores, geles que son conductores, y todo va hacia cuestiones de um, flexible uh, devices y um, eh, todas estas cuestiones de, 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 de polímeros que conducen electricidad. Muchas gracias y 